Good morning. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we are going to talk about something that I know I've talked about before, but I think it is important to, <laughs> to continue to talk about. We're going to talk about narcissism. Yes, that's right. We're going to talk about narcissism, parasitic entities, and spiritual warfare, because I think that these things are all closely connected. I think that they are related. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Yes, I think that narcissistic abuse is spiritual warfare. Uh, before we get into the discussion, I do think it's kind of um, helpful at first to like define things. So uh, the first thing that I should point out is that there are different kinds of narcissists. You know, there are grandiose or overt narcissists. There's covert or vulnerable narcissists. There is malignant and parasitic narcissists. And there may be more types, but, um, you know, maybe I can do separate videos on each type of narcissist because some of them are very, very different in their outward behavior, but inwardly, it all sort of stems from the same, um, the same insecurities, should we say, or the same kind of inner wounds. Um, but it, generally speaking, narcissists, um, or people who have NPD, uh, and I, I do not believe that this is just a so-called mental disorder, but it, it's typically characterized by the following traits. Um, an extremely self-centered person who has an exaggerated sense of self-importance. Um, I kind of want to point out here that er narcissism is a spectrum. So every single one of us has narcissistic traits to some degree. Uh, it's a spectrum. So there are people who are on the more extreme end of that spectrum, and uh, that's sort of what we're going to be talking about. But if you hear some of the things I'm talking about and you go, oh, I know somebody who acts like that, you know, just be very careful that you're not labeling somebody unfairly. Like, you're going to know if you're dealing with a, a dangerous person or not. You're eventually going to find out. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, they have a deep need for excessive attention and admiration, a lack of empathy for others. They have a distorted self-image and they um, are intensely preoccupied with themselves. You know, they are about themselves first and foremost. They tend to embellish and exaggerate their own accomplishments, intelligence, success, power, looks, whatever. Um, their preoccupation and their own self-absorption adds to this lack of empathy, which leads them to take advantage of others without really feeling regret or guilt. They can be extremely controlling, jealous, and overly sensitive. And uh, it is because of this oversensitivity that they might like angrily lash out at any criticism or pushback because they perceive that as a direct attack on them and they take it personally. They might, on the other hand, though, depending on what type of narcissist they are, they might instead retreat and give you the cold shoulder, the silent treatment. They might sulk and self-deprecate to guilt you and, and make you feel bad. They, they, you know, they might say things like, oh, I'm just the worst person. You know, I'm the bad guy. <laughs> things like that. You know, I can't do anything right. Um, so th these are, they're different narcissists have different things that they'll do. So, you know, a grandiose or overt narcissist might attack you directly, yell at you, how dare you criticize me? You know, do you know who I am? <laughs> you know, you are beneath me. How dare you? You know, you are nothing but the 
vulnerable, covert narcissist. It's going to be the silent treatment. They retreat. Um, they sulk. You know, you, you, it's a pity party, right? And you feel bad for them. They make you feel guilty. Um, you know, you, you might feel like you have incredibly wounded this shy, sweet, sensitive person. Even if the criticism or the pushback that you gave them was warranted or justified, you might find yourself apologizing, trying to lift their spirits. You know, uh, with a grandiose narcissist that directly attacks you, how dare you? You are nothing. How dare you say that to me? Do you know who I am? You might find yourself apologizing to them to try to placate them to get their lashing out to stop so that they calm down and you don't feel like you're in this state of like hyper vigilance, you know, this fight or flight mode. Uh, that they can put you in because, you know, the grandiose and overt narcissist can act like an animal when they are lashing out at you, uh, very predatory, and it puts you in a very defensive state. So, you know, there, but there's different, so this is important to know the differences between the different kinds of narcissistic people and how they react in different ways. Their lashing out could be different than a you know, verbal or physical lashing out. It could just be the withdrawing, withholding affection, withholding their love, withholding their attention, um, and withholding things that they normally would give you as a way to sort of like passive aggressively punish you. So you know, you know that you've done something wrong and they're punishing you for that. You criticize them, you pushed back on them, and you're going to pay for it. They might act out when they aren't getting special treatment or they aren't the center of attention. Under the surface, deep inside the narcissist is a wounded child and major, major insecurity. Uh, they feel inferior as people. Um, you know, it, it may be when they were children, they didn't get the love and the attention and the affection that they should have gotten. So they developed this facade, this persona. They developed these um, coping mechanisms of an air of superiority, of being unaffected, you know, things like that. Uh, as a child, they might have felt unloved, unwanted, and out of control. So they might have adopted narcissistic traits as a way to survive. As an adult, they might have an intense desire and need to be in control at all times, to control the people around them, whether that is family, friends, coworkers. They need to be in control. The grandiose narcissist might wear a facade of extreme confidence, but underneath that facade is a very fragile sense of self and a lack of genuine real self-esteem that is vulnerable to the slightest critique. You know, in, in many ways, um, you might not even know that you have upset them, right? That you've insulted them or whatever it might be that they perceive a slight from you and they the reaction to that is like an overreaction and you know it's sort of like in your mind you're like I don't think I did anything I wasn't trying to insult this person but that's how vulnerable and like fragile they are the slightest thing you know can set that off and trigger their inner uh, insecurity and then their their anger and their rage. Uh, these people tend to be generally unhappy and disappointed when they're when they aren't given like what they feel is owed to them. They are extremely entitled because they feel that they are special. They might find relationships to be unfulfilling to them. 
and they might not even know why. Uh, they just kind of go around miserable, unfulfilled. And, you know, it, it, they believe that, that they're special and just, you know, if only other people would recognize that, then obviously everything would be great. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like they, they expect to be like recognized as superior, but even without having the achievements that, that warrant it, you know, um, my mother, for example, just to, um, kind of make it a personal, <laughs> my mother was always entitled and she always felt like she deserved to be wealthy, successful, but she th believed that these things should be given to her by virtue of her simply existing. <laughs> she believed that a lifestyle was owed to her and that if she didn't have that, she wouldn't be happy. She was always living above her means, you know, driving fancy cars, but eating like peanut butter sandwiches that's constantly obsessed with the, this outward appearance and what other people were thinking of her. She had to look superior to others. She had to look better than other people. And she would act like she was better than everyone else, you know, without really having done anything to deserve that, you know? It's like, well, what are your actual successes and achievements? You haven't really accomplished anything um, on your own. So for her, she would uh, always try to latch on to a successful or wealthy man and then siphon resources from him. Um, for the covert narcissist or the vulnerable narcissist, they are the victim, the perpetual victim. <laughs> and if you think, you know, generally speaking, uh, talking about groups of people, there are certain groups, a certain group of people that are perpetual victims that cry out in pain as they strike you, very similar to the vulnerable narcissist. There's always a story about how they were robbed of what was owed to them, how everyone is out to get them, and how the only reason they aren't successful and uh, that they is, is that like they didn't have the opportunity and the breaks that others got. Like they see the success of others and they perceive it as ill gotten or somehow undeserved. They look at them and they don't think to themselves, oh, they worked really hard to earn that. No, they, they think that somehow they didn't deserve, they don't deserve that. I, I'm the one that deserves it. <laughs> it's, it's stuff like that, you know? And if only uh, life were more fair to me, I would be that successful. It's it's only because everything has conspired to take that from me, you know. In the speaking of that group that acts very much like a covert, vulnerable narcissist, it's uh, oh everybody hates me, and I don't know why. They just have this pathological hatred for uh, for us, and you know it's not because of our behaviors. It's not because of the things they do. No, no, they just have a pathological hatred of us for no reason at all. And then one day for no reason at all. And you understand what I'm talking about. And I think that as we continue this, you'll see more of that reflected in our society in general, which tends to be very narcissistic, especially in the age of the internet and social media, where narcissistic tendencies can be exacerbated because everybody has access now to everybody else. Um, and for the narcissist, that need for attention can be satiated. Well, I don't know if they'll ever be satiated, but they can try, right? They can constantly kind of put themselves out there in a way that maybe they weren't, weren't able to do not that long ago. They may be preoccupied and obsessive about fantasies of power, success, brilliance, beauty, or being the perfect mate or finding the perfect partner. Um, 
they can be very aggressive and like dominate and monopolize conversations you know they because they have to be the center of attention they have to you know show their superiority to others so they have to dominate and if somebody else is sort of like vying for attention with them they will mock and belittle them and try to make them feel inferior and they'll just do that in general if they perceive you as inferior to them or as weak they will try to dominate you mock you belittle you they'll talk over you um you know things like that they expect others to unquestioningly comply with their expectations or demands. They will take advantage of others to get what they want. They seem to be either uh, unwilling or unable to recognize and respect the needs and feelings and boundaries of others. Um, you know, it, it might just be because they don't, they really don't care. Uh, they're more they're so preoccupied with themselves and their own kind of self-absorption that perhaps they don't even consider other people as like human beings with their own like feelings wants desires needs it, it, it's just like what can I get from you how can you how can you help me or how can you help me get the things that I want or need and that's so, sort of like a, a petulant child you know um one good uh, book that you can read is called The Little Prince. The Little Prince is a very good description of the um, emotionally stunted narcissist that acts like the petulant child, you know, the 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 brat prince. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. They are very, very envious of others. And uh, they believe that um, other people like are envious of them like secretly jealous of them or desire like the things that they have uh, and the reason that they think that is because they're constantly projecting their own thoughts and behaviors onto others and so because they are deeply deeply envious of other people they assume that everybody else is like that too and everybody else thinks that way which really isn't the case but uh, you'll notice if you're dealing with a um a covert or a vulnerable narcissist if uh if you have something in your life that goes well like you've uh, accomplished a goal or something good has happened uh, they they will tell you that they're happy for you oh that's great i think that's great but deep down, they're injured by it. And later on, you know, in when they are uh, in one of their fights with you, they might bring that up and say that, you know, you only told them about that to try to make them jealous or so it, 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 something like that. And, and you're thinking like, what? What? <laughs> Why would you think that way? You think... It, and so like to them though because they're envious of you they have that like that secret envy that they're holding deep inside them and rather just telling you you know i'm jealous or something they, they hold it within and then sometimes they'll let it out and they'll say like you know you, you did that on purpose you wanted me to feel jealous and you're like no <laughs> i was just trying to like talk to you and you know i thought it, i i when good things happen to you i'm happy for you i'm excited for you because i care about you and i thought that maybe you'd feel the same but that's not the case and the uh the grandiose and malignant narcissist they can act in uh ways that are very like boisterous arrogant and haughty um, they come across as being very egotistical, conceited, boastful, and pretentious, but not the covert and vulnerable narcissist. Often they don't have that uh, out outwardly, um, you know, a facade, right? They can't, they're not grandiose. They're not the life of the party. They're, they don't have the facade of extreme confidence. They're more the type that appears to be shy um, or anxious. You know, 
uh, they ha- but they're they still have the same insecurities inside them and they still think that they are superior to others they just don't and they're still egotistical they're still uh, conceited uh, and arrogant it's just kind of concealed and that is why they're they're harder to deal with because you don't see it at first you know they they're in many ways very smart at how they go about things um because they they can bypass the initial red flags that a a grandiose and boisterous you know very loud narcissistic person would set off immediately you know you can see their flashiness and and you can kind of recognize them and see them a, a mile away um you know but the vulnerable and covert narcissist it's a different story they believe they are entitled to and deserve the best of everything and appearance is very very important to them they want nice things they want to look like they have nice things and they're very superficial and surface level when they are considering like a partner to be with someone to be in a relationship with the appearance is very important to them it, it might be more important than the personality of the of the individual and you know like compatibility and in like practical things like that it's like well they make me look good you know they you know this person's really attractive and so that's what matters and then they wonder why they're so miserable and unfulfilled and unsatisfied but they have to, you know, they they are superficial and they're very surface level. They, I'm not sure that they really think that deeply about things. Um, they may struggle with feeling depressed and moody because they cannot live up to their own um, unrealistic expectations. You know, uh, obviously, like all of us, they're going to fall short of perfection. And that is something that they cannot stand. And, it, and they have the same unrealistic expectations of others. So inevitably, you're going to get to the point where they are going to devalue and discard you. Um, well, they might not discard you. They might just go through processes of devaluing you and then coming back and hoovering and triangulating. Uh, it depends really on the situation and the individual. Um, but you're never going to be able to live up to their unrealistic expectations. You're, you're never going to be perfect. And so, um, they, they will, in the beginning, they'll idealize you. And they'll think that, oh, you're perfect, you're, you're so great, you're good at this, this, and that. And then when reality starts to come in um, and you're, you're not perfect, you know, <laughs> you have flaws, you have your own insecurities, your own moods, uh, your own um, vulnerabilities or whatever, you know, you're a human being, like when they start to see that, uh, they get angry. Like, why, are, why aren't you perfect? I wanted you to be perfect. I thought that you were going to be perfect. You know, I had idealized you. I put you up on a pedestal and now I've got to tear you down off of that pedestal because, you know, you don't live up to my expectations. You weren't perfect. And so th this is why they're, they're always unhappy. They cannot bring these expectations into alignment with reality, with themselves or with others. Um, you know, inwardly, they have uh, secret feelings of insecurity, shame, vulnerability, humiliation, and unsafety. Um, they're very concerned that people will see the, the, these things, you know, and they have to hide them and cover them up because that their their greatest fear is for people to basically see them for what they are and sort of like how weak they are. Um, now, moving on to a parasite. A parasite is an organism living in, on, or with another organism in order to obtain nutrients to grow or multiply 
often in a state that directly or indirectly harms the host. Again, I will remind you of speaking societally at a certain class of people, the political class, <laughs> and how they, they operate in a parasitic uh, relationship with the host, which is the society at large, the masses. They feed off of us and they plunder our wealth and, uh, you know, exactly like a parasite does and how it destroys the host um, and how it gorges itself, you know, until uh, like a tick, it becomes bloated and, and eventually falls off or seeks a new host, um, you know, in a group of people that have been uh, kind of re at certain points throughout history um, have been actually banished from countries like uh, over a hundred of them I believe because of this uh, behavior because they continuously act uh, in in the group behavior in a way that is very subversive to the rest of the the host nation um, so uh, in, in though in the human sense a uh, parasite is someone or something that kind of resembles a biological parasite in living off of being dependent on or exploiting another while giving nothing in return. So it's not a mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, it is one-sided. The narcissist is in many ways a parasitic entity. They are dependent on other people for their own emotional survival. Narcissists actively and persistently pursue other people in order to obtain their narcissistic supply, or rather, their sense of self-worth in life because they cannot generate that internally. They rely on others to like, reflect that to them, to create you know, and this is what they'll do in the beginning, um, you know, in the beginning when they're love bombing and stuff like that, they're sort of projecting a false image because it'll be reflected back to them and how the other person sees them. And it's that feeling that they're sort of like addicted to. And so, you know, many, in many cases, not all, all cases, but in many cases, these people is why they can't be faithful. Um, they're always going to be unfaithful because they're always going to need to kind of get that high again. They need to feel that feeling that only they can get from finding a new source of narcissistic supply because what eventually happens to each person, like each relationship that they get is eventually the mask comes off. They cannot maintain the facade forever and then people start to see them for how they really are and they're no longer getting that idealized image reflected back to them so they have to chase that again just sort of like a drug addict chasing a high they feed off of you and they drain you and then they will devalue and discard you and move on to their next victim or supply and that's not to say that after discarding you they won't come back um so in some cases, they'll never come back and they, they won't think twice about it. But in many cases, they will. They'll give you time to sort of recover after being uh, devastated. And then once you've built yourself back up, they'll come back again. And they'll start the process all over again, the cycle all over again. And they'll do that maybe um, repeatedly if you allow them. So, uh, it's, I think, important to recognize that narcissistic abuse is spiritual warfare. In the Bible, we read that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we know that Satan has legions of demons, and we know that he's given them, um, you know, certain... Uh, he gives them certain, I guess, authority uh, to kind of operate in the 
in the world. Um, we know that Satan is able to influence others, and we know that demons can influence others as well. So I, I'm sure everybody knows what or has heard of like demonic possession. Well, there are there's before possession, there is demonic influence, and there are people who are more susceptible to that. And I believe that narcissists uh, because of the trauma, the unresolved traumas they have from their childhood uh, and their their own fragility and vulnerability, I think that they're very easy targets for this demonic influence. And I think that that's often what happens, that you have demonic entities utilizing these people and influencing them and exacerbating their behavior probably unbeknownst to the narcissist, but that is what is happening, in my opinion. I mean, I, I once heard a victim of narcissistic abuse comment that uh, when the devil can't reach you, he sends a narcissist. And I thought that that was very, um, very insightful and very telling that like, yeah, you know, when, when the devil can't get to you, He'll send someone else, you know, and and then it'll be through that person that he, the devil tries to destroy you, um, and so yeah, that's just something to consider. I think I, that made a lot of sense to me, and that's certainly how I think it feels for many people that have been victims of narcissistic abuse. Uh, it is traumatizing in a way that is uh, unlike anything else. If you've never experienced it, you cannot understand why it is so traumatic and what it feels like. And it does feel like um, evil, like s something evil, or something with a dark energy has attacked you. It's very hard to describe, but if you know, you know. It is not simply a personality disorder or a mental illness. It is not simply a condition. The narcissist lacks a coherent self-identity, as I discussed, so they adopt a fake one. But because they lack their own internal identity and the ability to generate positive self-worth, they have to feed off of others like a parasitic entity. They seek to consume your soul. They want to completely control you and destroy you, sometimes only to build you back up and then demolish you again. And you know, they can build you up Un, in a way that is unlike anybody else because it's so calculated. They have the ability to kind of look at you and they'll know like exactly what to say to you. They'll know exactly how to word it and how to, how to make you feel so special, so seen and heard and loved and wanted. Um, and so after they have built you up to this uh, almost intoxicating high, then they demolish you, they pull the rug out from under you, they knock you down, they tear you down. Um, so it, it's sort of this up, down, up, down, black, white type of uh, thing, you know? And um, there is, in my opinion, no other way to view this except as emotional and spiritual warfare. The narcissist is trying to break you and, quite frankly, annihilate you. They will gaslight and they'll go into the crazy making behaviors all while presenting this kind of, you know, different, totally different persona to the outside world. They are calm, cool, collected, and you look insane. You're the one that looks anxious, uh, crazy, hysterical, paranoid, while they seem totally uh, unbothered by it, you know, and, you know, they'll also, they'll try to isolate you and kind of slowly destroy your sense of reality so that you are dependent on them, not just like financially, in many cases they do that, but also for, for a sense of reality. 
that you will begin to rely on them to tell you what is real and what is not because they'll make you feel like you're so crazy that you're unable to process reality. You can't tell what's actually going on or you get things wrong or, you know, you they'll make you feel like you are that you need them to help you discern what's real and what isn't. This abuse is not visible um, unless they are uh, physically abusing you. Like with the malignant narcissist, they can be extremely violent, but not, not always. Most narcissists are very smart, and this is uh, psychic wounds, um, and it's invisible. It's mental, and I think that makes it more insidious because there is no outward appearance of abuse. You can't be going into work or walking down the street and, and regular people be able to look at you and say, that person is being hurt. That person is being abused. They're, they're a victim of, of some something, right? Um, no, it's, it's invisible. So people don't know when they look at you, they, they might have no idea. Um, it is a spiritual war, and that is why it's so devastating and traumatic. The narcissist at first appears very, very charming. They will dazzle you like a vampire. You know, if you've ever seen um, Hollywood movies or read books about vampires, they have this sort of like illusion magic where <laughs> they can kind of dazzle people. That is like what the narcissist does. Uh, they feed off of you and they drain you emotionally, energetically, spiritually, and sometimes even physically and financially, uh, depending on the narcissist and how far the abuse goes. They might take everything from you, your children, your home, properties that you've owned, all of your resources. They just, they suck it from you. And that is, it's exhausting, even if it doesn't get to that point, just the emotional, energetic and spiritual uh, draining is exhausting. But there's also when they when they um, go through this process of kind of tearing you down and then building you back up, uh, this what is created as sort of like a trauma bond. If you don't know what that is, I encourage you to look it up. There are videos where you can read about or watch, you know, learn about this stuff. There are articles you can read about it. Uh, it's the so-called enmeshment that occurs between the abused and the abuser, right? Where they kind of form this, you know, in some ways you could call it like a Stockholm syndrome, but because you've been through an experience together that was traumatic, you feel bonded to that person. You feel close to them, like, oh, you know, it, it's very hard to explain. Um, but it's like the symbiotic relationship between the host and the parasite. Uh, you're feeding them by providing them with narcissistic supply, you know, in that kind of sense of self-worth that they need, the attention, the validation. But you're getting something from this too. That's why I said symbiotic relationship. And this is something that victims of narcissistic abuse don't want to admit. In many cases, they want to say that they're the victims. And it's like, no, no, you have played a role in this as well you were getting something out of it. It's why you kept it going, you know, and you have your own responsibility. I'm in many ways, victims of narcissistic abuse. They'll say that the narcissist is, uh, never takes, uh, accountability or responsibility for the damage that they do and the things that they do wrong. But a lot of times victims of narcissistic abuse, they don't want to take any accountability or responsibility for what they allowed to happen to them. And I'm not victim blaming or anything like that. Uh, I know how hard it is, but you have to look at it objectively and be honest with yourself, right? So you're feeding the narcissist, giving them supply, the validation, the sense of self-worth, the emotional uh, high that they need, 
but the narcissist is also mirroring and feeding back to you your own desires. Narcissists have a way of being able to, like they're very good at reading people and they can read people very quickly. They have a way of like assessing people and kind of knowing what it is that that person wants, desires, what you're lacking maybe in your life or maybe what you've always wanted in a friend and a partner. They will make you feel as if like they're... They, that your prayers have been answered, right? And they are that thing that you, you know, the person of your dreams, like they're very good at that. And they'll ask you questions that maybe don't make sense to you at the time, but it, what they're really doing is trying to kind of get, find out like, oh, what is it that this, what are their, this, what's this person's past hurts? What is it that they want? What is it that they desire? Like, they'll be able to kind of assess that and say, oh, this is what I can, you know, give to them and, and mirror to them and feed back to them. And so this is the symbiotic relationship. You're giving them supply and they are giving you basically what you desire. It is what the charm is about, the, um, the attention uh, and things like that. And so this is why it is so hard to break free uh, from the narcissist and that cycle of abuse. Um, it, this type of spiritual warfare can even cause temporary insanity. Again, when, when you're being gaslit and you're being told that you're crazy and that uh, they'll say something and then they'll tell you they never said it. They'll, they'll look you right in the eyes and say, I never said that when they literally just said it. And so they'll make you think that you're going crazy and losing your mind. You start to question your own reality. You start to question your own sense of self-worth. And you can literally go crazy. It can drive a person insane to be constantly told that something they saw and heard didn't actually happen. Or to be told that you said and did something you didn't do. That you never said. And they'll insist that you said that. Or they'll insist that you did something you never did. And, and so it creates this sort of cognitive dissonance. And then, yeah, people can go insane temporarily. Luckily, it's temporary. Um, but when you're in that confused state, you're very easy to control and to manipulate. Um, but it, And it also makes recovery very hard. These are spiritual and psychic wounds. And some people never recover. Like a skilled predator, the narcissist abuses you in a very unique way. They attack the central nervous system. It has physical uh, symptoms. Um, it's why we end up with PTSD. You feel broken down. You feel depleted. And you rely on them to build you back up and regulate you emotionally. That's what they do. They sort of hijack your central nervous system and get you to be to become dependent on them for emotional regulation and when they're not there when they're not in your life you feel dysregulated you feel anxious sad depressed lonely miserable and you crave that person to come back and make you feel whole again make you feel safe um it isn't just about like feeding off of you though uh scientists have when they have looked at parasites, right, they have discovered that in some cases, parasites have been able to actually alter the brain and the behavior of the host to get the host to assist in fulfilling vital parts of the parasite's life cycle, even to the detriment of the host, and in many cases, leading to the death of the host. So, there's that. Uh, like most parasites, narcissists rarely kill their hosts, although the malignant ones might. Uh, but the, you know, like the mind altering type of parasite, the narcissist works to control the brains and the emotions of their supplier, the person giving them narcissistic supply. They do so by employing a wide range of manipulations from bullying to projecting denying to gaslighting to guilt tripping to silent treatment to invalidating 
I, the list goes on and on. They have a repertoire of things that they'll pull out, you know, at different times, learn things that they've learned, you know, have worked for them in the past. Uh, the narcissist continually orchestrates the reality around their victim by enlisting others, uh, people in the uh, community who have suffered from narcissistic abuse, you know, on the forums that have talked about this, they refer to these people as flying monkeys. These are people that the narcissist has been able to manipulate and keep around as a source of supply. These people they'll have in their employ and they can get these people to participate in bullying and smear campaigns uh, to the benefit of the narcissist to go after a victim or somebody that's going to expose them, right? They feel like they're going to be exposed by somebody. Then they bring, they enlist others, they bring out the flying monkeys and those people will support them and their delusions of grandeur and they'll help them by punishing uh, the victim if they don't comply, right? And give that person what they want. The narcissist chooses their victims carefully. Often it's because that you have something that they lack. And this is, you know, where I think some of the maybe more sp spiritual aspects of this come from, that there's something inside you, right? They can sense that, that maybe that you have uh, virtue, right? There's something good inside you. You're one of God's people, you're, you know, a good Christian, like they'll, they'll sense something about you. You have something that they lack. Maybe it's a goodness or it's some kind of like brightness, something inside you that they covet. And it's a compulsion. Like they have a strong desire for that, not for you, but for something it is, some quality that you have that they wish they had. And this is why they can at times appear so, um, interested, right? they're there. They seem like they, they care about what you have to say. They'll ask you questions, things like that. But that care is actually, actually an uncontrollable compulsion because the narcissist needs attention the way that humans need water and oxygen to survive. And of course they're human. Don't get me wrong, but like a demon, they will become eventually envious of you. And then they'll begin to kind of feed off of your energy, your emotions, your soul. And uh, in many ways, they're like sort of like a, a mind parasite, a psychic parasite that burrows its way inside of you and, and like makes a home inside your, your brain. And they begin to devour you from the inside out. Like a powerful demon, they are hard to exercise, but you can eventually break free of that cycle. You just have to recognize reality. I think it's very helpful to talk to other people who have been victims of narcissistic abuse and get an objective opinion. You know, I think that there are times in every person's life when they are, uh, when the red flags, they can't ignore anymore. Um, or when they eventually get devalued and discarded, like eventually you're going to figure out what's going on. And yes, it might be very hard, but it's, it's good to get an objective outside opinion, you know, and there are things that you can do to kind of build yourself up and make yourself like resilient to that kind of abuse and manipulation. And part of that is, after rebuilding yourself, right? Working on yourself, rebuilding your own confidence and self-esteem. And this is why it's good to have friends because I think that's so important. Many people, they've been isolated. So maybe after years of being in that kind of abusive, toxic relationship, they don't have anybody in their life and they feel like the narcissist was right about them and all the nasty things that they said and that they don't deserve you know, to have friends or to be loved or something like that. But it, it can, you'd be surprised at the kind of difference that like one person can make. Just one person being there for you, being supportive, telling you that they care about you, building you up, um, you know, you'd be surprised. And so it's, I think it's really important to reach out to other people. If you kind of get into the state where you are, you feel like you're 
you're going to have a mental breakdown or something, reach out to people. I went through some, uh, not this type of situation, but I, I've gone, I was going through a dark time last year and I did that. It was uncomfortable. It was hard, but, um, I reached out to somebody and they've helped me tremendously. I've changed a lot in a year. And part of that was sort of building up my confidence, my self-esteem and just trusting that like I can that I can do things right um but yeah I have grown up around these people um you all know if you've been a listener of my channel you know about my family and um you know I just think that uh it's something that you're gonna come in contact you're gonna come into contact with at some point in your life and it's good to kind of understand to be able to see these people for what they are and then to apply this to the um society right the world is very narcissistic uh, the world is fallen and um you know we know as christians that we will be hated by the world and we will be persecuted and I think that that's something to keep in mind as well, that a lot of the times when we go through these hard uh, times in our life and, and we're suffering and we feel pain and we don't know why, often that we're growing, right? Like there's some kind of lesson that we're learning and um, something good can come of that. And then I think it also, it, number one, it provides humility, but also it gives you the ability to kind of relate to others, to empathize with others, and to help other people. And I think that that's really what our purpose here is. So anyways, this has gotten very long. I didn't expect it to be this long. <laughs> There's a lot more to say about this. If you like this video, let me know. Uh, comment below if you've ever been through a similar situation, if you kind of agree or disagree with what I said, if you want me to do more videos on stuff like this, let me know. I always appreciate your opinions. I always love hearing from you guys. Some of y'all make me laugh a lot. Um, yeah, like subscribe if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet. And if you would like to, you can tip me for my work. Um, I have links in the video description to ways that you can donate to me. I'm, you know, <laughs> no longer allowed on certain platforms. So, you know, there's really only like two ways to do that. But anyways, um, really the most important is just to share the video because I think that they're burying my channel. And um, yeah, let me know if you enjoy me talking about this topic, if you want to hear more about it. Uh, and I want to hear what you guys think. You know, am I on to something here with the spiritual warfare and the parasitic uh, qualities of, you know, you know what? <laughs> Reed!